It was late February of 2014. Putin sent plainclothes troops into Crimea, little green men, they called them. He, they annexed it and later installed a government. Days before, in the Ukrainian capital, the pro-Russia regime had fallen. The president went into exile in Russia, and the eastern region of Ukraine, called the Donbass, Russian-speaking locals began protesting the new government in Kyiv. Demonstration escalated to conflict. So Russia took advantage, supported the separatists, and now Russia controls part of the region inside Ukraine. Generally, the parts of Luhansk and Donetsk along the Russian border. Think of them as counties, Russian separatists controlling the eastern part near its border and Ukraine, the areas to the west. Well, yesterday, Vladimir Putin recognized as independent not just the Russian-controlled areas, but the whole of those two counties, if you will, and said he was sending Russian troops in. That's the invasion. Going forward, the Russian forces to cross that line of conflict between the east and west of Luhansk and Donetsk, the Ukrainian forces stationed on that line now protecting it would likely resist. That's one possibility for how a full-blown war could begin. Let's bring in Michael McFall, former U.S. ambassador to Russia. He's met and negotiated face-to-face -face with Vladimir Putin. Ambassador, thanks again. It appears President Putin wants to redraw the map of Europe. Is he succeeding so far? So far, he is. A great explanation, by the way. Very important about those two counties. I think that's a good uh, word to you, or, re or regions. But they're split, as you just showed with the contact line. He declared that they're now independent countries. He signed two agreements with the two leaders of those places. Then he signed a second uh, set of agreements with both of them, saying, we are now military partners. Uh, and I suspect that means that the next phase will be taking the rest of those territories in those two places. That means a direct war with Ukraine. You know, he, you've mentioned a million times he's been building up a sort of pot of money to resist this sort of thing for years in preparation for withstanding Western sanctions. With that in mind, do the sanctions announced by President Biden today go far enough for this point? Well, I applaud what they did today. It was better than what they did yesterday. Uh, that they're using the word invasion and the beginning of invasion, I think that's a, the right thing to do. And some of these sanctions were important. Uh, VB Bank, which I used to work when, with, with well, I know them uh, when I was the ambassador. That's a major bank. Uh, we used to call it Putin's slush fund. Uh, so that's hitting Putin uh, where it counts. And they added in their uh, uh, sanctions this time around the kids of some of the people that are close to Putin. That's a new step. That's qualitatively different than anything else. Mm. It, it Does wasn't, it change? No, I didn't mean to interrupt. Please continue the thought. But, but does it change Putin's thinking? My answer to that is no. Uh, you know, Putin's not thinking about the stock market next week in Russia. He's not thinking about Zbear Bank and VTB and VEB and what's going to happen to them. He doesn't even care about the oligarchs that are going to be hurt by these sanctions. Uh, he cares about where he's going to be in history books 30, 40 years from now. And that's why I think they're the right thing to do. I want to be clear about that. If you take an aggressive, wrong act, there has to be a response. But I think we're naive if we think that that response is going to change his calculus. Well, part of that response, wouldn't that be a message to others, thinking China versus Taiwan and other parts of the world? Absolutely. And that is an important part of the signaling going on here. And by the way, not just the United States, but others that levied new sanctions today. The Germans de facto killed Nord Stream 2. Uh, I hope it's for good, by the way. Let's see. You know, let's read the details about how long that lasts. But I do think it's important to signal that we're going to stand up for democracy. I think in our fight with China, by the way, over the long decades to come, which I fully suspect will be the number one security challenge for the United States for this century, one of our greatest powerful instruments in that fight are our values, sure. our democratic values. And if we don't stand up for them in Europe, people are going to wonder, are we going to stand up for them in Asia? You, you know, just a few, it feels like a few weeks ago, all we were hearing and getting on background and otherwise was, we're shifting to China. We're shifting everything to China. That's where we got to focus. Then all of a sudden, the Chinese and Putin shook hands, and then all of a sudden, Putin's redrawing Europe. And I wonder, while all this crap is going on, what are the Chinese doing, you know? Well, they're watching very closely uh, in two respects. One, they're seeing how uh, much credible commitment we have to defending our values and our allies in the region. Um, 
And two, they're managing their partner, right? So you're right. Uh, Xi Jinping and President Putin met uh, right at the beginning of the Olympics. They released this like 6,000 word document talking about how they're all close. But now suddenly Mr. Putin is doing some belligerent things that I think the Chinese are nervous about. Uh, they want to change the international order, but they want to reform it. They don't want to destroy it. Putin seems like he wants to destroy it. And I'm not so sure the Chinese want to go along with him on that. He, he wants a world where there are two superpowers negotiating and one's a check on the other. I mean, that's what he had prior to the end of the Cold War. It just seems like who in the world would think that that's something that could be revitalized now, especially with China over there? You would think not, but Vladimir Putin's been in power for 22 years. Uh, he doesn't listen to anybody anymore. He sits by himself. He doesn't have many conversations with advisors. Mm. In the outside world, there's only one guy that he respects, that's Xi Jinping, who thinks he's his equal. So I think he's, you know, I think he's taking risky behavior uh, because he, you know, he's isolated. And he's not thinking about the long-term consequences. And there's one other thing I think it's very important for everybody to remember. Putin's comfortable with war. He's gone to war four times already. Chechnya, 1999. Georgia, 2008, Ukraine, 2014, Syria, 2015, and he won all those wars, at least from his perspective. That means that he's not so afraid to launch a fifth war against Ukraine. Michael McFall, thanks again.